Chapter Three: News of the Sea Raven. The boy and the butler moved their carpet bags into a cabin with one porthole, four bunks, and six passengers. A hammock was strung up for Jack, since Mountain Jim preferred to sleep on the floor with his yellow bobcat cap for a pillow. There was room for all. Shucks, he smiled. If I was to sleep in a bed, I think I was sick. Among their cabin mates was Doctor Buckby, the horse doctor. He was going out to the mines on his wooden leg to locate a rich gold deposit. He had a map. He whispered, "That marked the very spot." At the same time, he carried an alarm trumpet around his neck day and night in case anyone tried to take the map from him. In addition to Mountain Jim and Doctor Buckby, there was an ex-soldier named Nath. Tweedy, he still wore his forage cap and hickory shirt, and kept his rifle and bayonet propped in a corner of the cabin. Finally, there was Mister Azariah Jones, a jolly Yankee trader who was as big as the cabin was small. As Jack was soon to discover, Mister Azariah Jones could squeeze through the cabin door only by holding his breath. He said he weighed three hundred pounds, barefoot and bald-headed. It amused Praiseworthy that the Yankee trader had unwittingly provided Jack and himself with their accommodations in the hold. The eighteen barrels of potatoes belonged to Mr. Azariah Jones, who planned to sell them in San Francisco. When all of these passengers were in the cabin at one and. The same. It seemed to Jack that the walls would burst. At night, the chorus of snoring and snorting was a sea-going grand opera. Jack learned to fall asleep with his fingers in his ears. When a good wind was blowing, the Lady Wilmes spread her sails and saved fuel. Day by day, the sun grew more fiery. Soon, there was hardly a breath of air left on shipboard. The canvas hung limp and dispirited from the yard arms. Tar oozed from between the deck planking and dripped from the rigging, but with her machinery clanking, the ship went thrashing on, digging her stout bows into the equator. Wherever Jack went, good luck. The pig came trotting at his heels. When Jack stretched out under the stern boat to add a few words to his letter, the porker found himself and nuzzled into the shade beside him. Jack refused to scratch his back. "I told you yesterday," he said. He must be stern. "You better stop following me. We've got to stop being friends, you and me, sir. I've made up my mind. If pigs were so smart, they wouldn't eat so much. See how fat you're getting? Don't you know you're going to end up in the galley?" Every time the cook sees you, he smacks his lips. Sunday dinner—that's what you are. Go away, sir. But the pope porker merely nudged Jack's elbow lovingly with his black snout. I told you," said Jack. "I'm not going to scratch your back any more. Let me be." There was no reasoning with the porker. He promptly fell asleep in the shade, and Jack gave a heavy sigh. There was no escape for the pig. Next week or the week after, the cook would come looking for him with a meat cleaver. Jack put it out of his mind and let the porker sleep. For a moment, he watched the flying fish, startled by the crash of paddle wheels, leap through the air like arrows shot from the sea. Then he wrote, "I take pen in hand again, dearest aunt and dearest sisters, to tell you of our adventures to date." But first, I will say that you would hardly know me these winter days. I am brown to a crisp, except for my nose. It sunburns something awful and keeps peeling. Captain Swain says my nose looked like a molting chicken. We still have had no sight of the sea raven, so I can't tell you how the race is coming. I certainly hope we win. Praiseworthy wants me to be sure to remember him to you. I see. I have already said that above. He just passed by. He walks around the deck fifty times every day. He carries his umbrella for shade. 
Hoping you will not worry, I will confess that we had a certain misfortune at the outset of our voyage, but all is well now. I have already mentioned the judge who rolls his own cigars. We took him for a gentleman, but there was an error in judgment. He is a desperate scoundrel whose name is Cut Eye Higgins. Imagine! But he was no match for praiseworthy. I can tell you now that Mr. Cut Eye Higgins had stolen our money. He had to work off our passage at the coal bins. We never complained, not once. Praiseworthy says that if it weren't for me, we might never have trapped Mr. Cut Eye Higgins, but it was really the other way around. Praiseworthy never gets takes credit for himself. All I did was take good luck to the bunkers with me, where he got covered with coal dust. That put the idea in Praiseworthy's head. Some day, when we sail back to Boston with our po pockets full of gold nuggets, I'll tell you more and make you laugh. But you will be glad to know that Mr. Cut Eye Higgins spends his day at the fire below decks while we have our rightful cabin. <clears throat> we thought we would never find the rest of our money, which the thief had hidden. Captain Swain helped us search the cabin, lighting up one of Mr. Cut Eye Higgins' homemade cigars. We looked everywhere. <clears throat> and wouldn't have found the money at all if Captain Swain hadn't began to choke on the cigar. There. Rolled up inside were our Boston banknotes. I will mail this letter at our first port of call, Rio de Janeiro. Imagine that your devoted runaways are seeing the world. <coughs> I must stop now as I heard, oh, just overheard someone call, Ship Ahoy! Maybe it is a sea raven. When Jack looked up, the captain was standing on the paddle box, squinting at a distant ship through his brass long glass. Blast, he scowled. She's not the sea raven, mates. She's a square rigger. Be calmed, no doubt. There's, there's not enough breeze in these latitudes to snuff out a candle. It was almost two hours before the two ships came within hailing distance. Praiseworthy finished his 50 laps around deck and Jack locked good luck in his pen. But 10 minutes later, the porker was at Jack's heel again. Captain Swain got out his silver speaking tube and shouted across the water. With all her sails hanging like great curtains, the square rigger seemed to Jack like some giant of the seas. Ahoy! Ahoy! answered the master of the square rigger through his silver speaking tube. Have you seen the sea raven, sir? Aye, Captain, she came steaming by a day ago. Captain Swain lowered the speaking tube from his lips long enough to say blast. The voice from the square rigger floated across again. Can you give us a tow, Captain? What's that? I've been becalmed for a week. We're 36 days out of New Orleans and bound for California. Fever has broken out below deck, sir. The sea raven turned her back on us and ran. I beg you, sir, give us a tow until we catch a wind to make port. Jack, standing on a capstan, could tell that Captain Swain was about to order full speed ahead. But now he could be seen pacing back and forth on the paddle box, growling and grumbling to himself. Under the tropical sun, the brass button of his coat glowed like lumps of fire. Towing the square rigger would slow the Lady Wilma to dawn's crawl. Praiseworthy, too, under his black umbrella, watched the captain. Every gold seeker aboard seemed to be holding his breath, waiting for Captain Swain to make his decision. To come to the aid of the square rigger could very well mean that Lady Wilma might be put out of the race. She might never catch up with the sea raven. Captain Swain rubbed his plump nose. He cocked an eye at the sailing ship with her canvas hanging dead from the yards. Then he raised a speaking tube to his lips and shouted, Glad to help, sir. We'll throw you a hoser. There came a wild shouting from the rails of the square rigger where passengers and crew tossed hats in the air. Jack couldn't help being swept up in their joy and relief, and he told himself that the Lady Wilma might yet get back in the race. If Captain Swain didn't think of something praiseworthy would, within the hour the side wheeler was in harness like a sturdy ox pulling her burden across the equator. The great southern cross rose higher in the heavens. Jack's education proceeded without books. 
praiseworthy borrowed Captain Swain's brass long glass, and at night the sky became their textbook. They examined strange constellations and star clouds. It was a glittering landscape never seen or overheard in Boston. Praiseworthy, said Jack. Was my father anything like you? I mean, nothing like me, Master Jack. They were silent for a moment. There were times when Jack felt a great emptiness, a loneliness that not even Aunt Arabella could dispel. Even if they should find no gold in California, he was glad to be traveling with Praiseworthy, to be sharing adventures and even misfortunes. Were you always a butler, he asked. Always. Jack brushed the hair out of his eyes. I mean, if you weren't a butler, you wouldn't have to call me Master Jack as if we were at home. We're partners. You could call me Jack, plain Jack. Oh, I couldn't do that. It wouldn't be proper, no indeed, but I'd like it just fine. We mustn't forget my position, Master Jack, but if we strike it rich, you won't have to be a butler anymore. Oh, I shouldn't be, or I shouldn't like to be anything but a butler. Not for a moment. I was born to my calling like my father before me and his father before him. It will please me to go on serving your Aunt Arabella. Look there, Master Jack, I believe that is the consolation of the whale. A fine sight, isn't it? The two gold ships linked together like sausages went lumbering through the sea. On the fifth day, a puff of wind began to tug at the square rigger jibs. And then one after the other, the top sails, the royals and the mainsail swelled out like a great white, like out like great white clouds. By grabs, she's caught a wind, roared Captain Swain leaning out of the pilot house window. With a general shout, the square rigger threw off the tow lines and the two ships parted. There was a final exchange of good wishes. Then the Lady Wilma kicked up her paddle wheels, relieved of her burden, and sprinted forward. She was back in the race. <laughs>